Welcome back to Object Oriented Programming and Design. This is part 11. We're going to talk about getting input from the outside world. First I want to start with this color coding that I'm using in the presentation. Concepts are hopefully mostly highlighted in yellow. Keywords, things you're going to find in Python or in black font and variable names that we are giving and creating strings and things like that arbitrary things are in green font um, links all of the internet links are clickable now Eclipse will actually color code your program like you see here and you can specify the colors and on the screen there I'll show you what the menu uh, preferences are Okay, let's talk about the most common ways of getting input. We can get input directly from the user, you know, from a person. Most often these days this is done with some type of uh, graphics, some kind of GUI. Later we're going to use Kivi for that. You can get input from the console, the command line interface. It's much easier to program that, um, but it's much more clumsy for the human. You can read a file from, say, the network or a hard disk drive or a USB disk or something like that. Or you can read from some hardware-based sensor. Uh, most of those are going to give you ASCII characters. Uh, files come in a lot of flavors, but essentially there's two major types, binary and text. Binary files are the things that you've seen like MP4, JPEGs, MP3s, PDFs. That's just seriously a big, long, coded sequence of zeros and ones. And text files sometimes come in what's called comma-separated values. So I'll let you read about that. There's some links you can use. We want to get input from the user for this next example. We're going to use the function called input, and it takes the form of x equals input, and then you put a prompt. The prompt is an optional string that's going to be displayed on the screen. If the user just hits enter, you're going to get an empty string. You always get a string from this function, and then you have to convert it to a number if that's what you're looking for. So let's ask for a parachute diameter using a while loop, and the concept from slide 99, easier to ask forgiveness than permission. So the exact clause, except clause, will be executed if there's an error converting the answer to a float. In other words, if you ask the guy for a diameter and he enters any, well, any is not a diameter, so you have to tell him, hey, dork, you got to enter a number. And if you look at the clause here, maybe you hit pause and look at it, that's exactly what this is going to do. This is how you open a file. A file is a physical thing on a hard disk or removable disk or a memory card or something. And an operating system will give you a file handle, which is technically a pointer for the hard disk drive or, you know, external drive. Handles depend on the operating system, but Python takes care of all of that. You can specify the file handles as read, write, or append, and is binary or text. Append will take an existing file and add to the end of it. Write will create a new file or overwrite the existing one, and read reads from the file. There's a link there so you can see more information about how open works. At first, you're probably going to work with text files, not binary files. Um, the three modes are specified with the letters R, W, and A, and the open function is used inside a very special code block that we designate with the keyword with. And what with does is it opens and closes the file handle as required by the operating system without us having to worry about all that kind of stuff. And there's an example here of how it's used. You see it's just one line. Very, very nice. So let's open a file as an example here. 
Sometimes you'll put a loop in there. For example, you want to open the file and then read every single line in the file, put it into a memory array, then close the file. That's usually good practice. You don't want to keep a file open forever because power could go out, you can have a glitch, any kinds of things could happen. So let's take an example here. So we define a method called read file, and you see that the method starts off by making an empty list, an empty array, then with open, and you put the path name and uh, file name all together. Mode, I'm going to assume reading, and buffering is an optional parameter. I'm specifying here one line at a time. And then I'm going to give my file handle a name, f handle. The loop is simple. For a line in the handle, append that line into my array called all lines. And then I have a little print command there that just tells me how many lines were read. And that's it. That's all you have to do. You don't have to worry about opening and closing and looking for the end of file and all that kinds of stuff. F handle acts as an iterator. That's another one of the vocabulary words for object-oriented design and programming. An iterator is sort of a type of a special list that kind of makes itself. You know, before you would put, or before what we've done is we've created a list and specified the members. An iterator creates the members as you go through it. And this will become more and more and more important about uh, um, as we learn more about object-oriented programming, okay? Uh, we open the F handle with R so we can read. Text files are the default. Here's a CSV example. CSV, again, is comma-separated values, a sort of a loose standard for text files. And the CSV package, which comes with Python, is written to handle the most common usages of CSV. Here's an example right out of the documentation. Note the width statement and note the CSV reader. And the join method here, it just joins all of the items in row with a string, which is just a comma and a space, and the output would be as you see there in red, spam, 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 spam. And if you can recognize, that is a song from Monty Python. Let's get input from a sensor. The most common based, I'm sorry, the most common sensor input is going to be the current time or some kind of precision timer from the processor. The date time time package, which is a sub package of date time, is used to read the local current like clock time, you know, what you would read on your watch. The time package, and I, and I hate that name, it's an unfortunate name, I really think it should be called timer package, is used for timers and precision timers, but those are two separate packages. Other hardware-based sensors usually come with their own software, they usually require some kind of initialization, and some kind of a warm-up time, and then a separate command to read the data. And I'm giving you some examples there. Now let's look at a practical example. Let's look at our new software problem, your Rocket Club's parachute inventory. You can find the file, the inventory file, in the shared folder. There's a link there. And the columns are name, is the name of our parachute, the diameter, a floating point number, the material in GSM, and uh, that's a standard for uh, textiles, cloths, it's grams per square meter, and it measures how much the material weighs, the color, the skew, and how many of these things we have in stock. The delimiter, the thing that's separating them, is a comma, and the quote character is the double quote pretty standard in CSV world. The new line character is going to be the default character for your operating system. Um, Apple, Linux, Android use one type of new line character. Windows uses a different one, but Python takes care of that stuff. 
The CSV package documentation is on that link, so you can click on it and uh, learn more about it. Okay, so let's read the inventory. The CSV reader method will produce a list for each line. The first line in a CSV file typically has the column names. The CSV dictionary reader produces a dictionary for each line. That's a type that we mentioned way back in slide 41. Often much more useful because it makes the code clearer to read, although it does make it sometimes more difficult to write. As you can see, it's clearer to access row subscript color than row subscript three, especially if there is, you know, 35 columns. I mean, you know, it's hard to remember what row 31 is as compared to row 32. So let's create a list that holds all of the lines of inventory. So this is essentially a list of lists, also called a two-dimensional array. And let's ask the user for the name of the file. And we're going to use the file name that they gave us as the parameter to your inventory reading. Now we're going to get really fancy and we're going to figure the maximum weight that any one of our parachutes can actually handle safely. And so for the club's purposes, let's figure out the maximum weight. And now we know the equation. So algebra says that weight has to equal such and such. Remember to use kilograms, not grams, and remember to use meters, not centimeters. You keep the units consistent, and then you can, after you do the calculation, then you can convert them to whatever you want. So let's modify physics stuff. Let's add a new method, which is called max mass falling object. Take this coefficient of drag, the area, the terminal velocity as parameters. Modify parachute stuff, add this new method, max mass hemi for hemisphere, and then take the centimeter diameter and terminal velocity as parameters. And let's default the terminal velocity to three meters per second. So the club stuff main program now should create a club stuff object and a parachute stuff object ask the user for a file name, create the list, throw out the first line using slicing. This is something we talked about also because the first line contains the column names and we don't need those. Sort the inventory list, ignore the in the name of the parachute, go through the inventory list in a loop and then for each parachute print the name, the skew, the diameter, the quantity in stock and the maximum capacity in grams. Let's assume a really slow desired terminal velocity of four and a half meters per second. And this is what the output should look like. This is some, essentially what we're looking for, something like this. The columns have headings. The was ignored in the name of the parachute. Python is considered a terse language. There's very little fluff and decoration. So it might get confusing as you start, just like you would with any language. For an extra challenge, ask the user for the desired terminal velocity, only accept two to five. And outside that range, remind the user that he's screwing up, as you see there on the screen. The main area of club stuff appears here. You see, it's only a few lines of code. I think it's uh, 30 lines or something. Getting the name from the user is a separate function. There's no self keyword because it's not part of an object. This is what we talked about before. This is a procedure. Kill the is a lambda function that we're using in the sort. If you remember, lambda is a one line function one colon ignores the first line that we read from the file and the format methods makes the output line up nice and easy, uh, nice and cleanly. Um, P name and P diameter variables are for readability lines 56 through 60. Technically they're not required. We could just put all that stuff in the print statement. It just makes it really ugly to read.
Finally, here's some new methods. This class inherits from physics stuff, so this new method is inherited, and we call it, just like any other method that belongs to our class by using self. And hopefully you enjoyed that. That was the end of part 11, and I'll see you soon on part 12.